morning. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started today. Uh, this is Jeanette Gass from IASP, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. This is the third in a series related to the 2020 Global Year for the Prevention of Pain. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to let you know that there are several ways to get started uh, or to participate in today's webinar. Um, the, for the Q&A, you can type your questions into the Q&A section of the Zoom meeting control window or also in the chat. Um, you can tweet using hashtag Global Year 2020 and you can follow IASP Pain on Twitter. Um, if you want to visit for additional resources, you can go to iasp-pain.org slash global year. Uh, first thing we're going to do is introduce our moderator, Ramesh Balasubramanian, and he'll introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Um, my, so my, uh, my name's Ramesh Balasubramanian. I'm an oral medicine specialist I'm from Perth, um, Australia. So if you're wondering, it is 8.03 p.m. So um, good evening to those from around the world. Um, so we've got three speakers today who are gonna be speaking on um, um, prevention of orofacial pain. Um, there's Professor Tara Renton, there's Dr. Olga Korzinevska. I think I've got that right, Olga, I hope. Um, it was and perfect. Dr. Thank you, and Dr. Amanda Poon-Yuen. Um, so uh, Professor Tara Renton will be starting um, her lecture first. and. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Renton to you all. The title of her presentation is Preventing Fifth Nerve Injury and Neuropathic Pain. Uh, Tara is Professor in Oral Surgery at King's College London and an Honorary Consultant at King's College Hospital Foundation Trust and Guys and St. Thomas Foundation Trust. She is also past president of the British Association of Oral Surgeons and Honorary Fellow of the American Association of Oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Now, just before um, Tara takes over, I'd just like to um, inform you that we'll be taking questions in the end after all three speakers are done. Um, I trust there'll be literally hundreds of questions and hopefully we'll get through a fraction of those and I apologize in advance if we don't get to your question. Over to you, Tara. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, I've got technically 20 minutes to present to you what probably should be about 10 different lectures, um, but I'm giving you an overview of how to prevent neuropathic pain. Um, I'm trying to change the slides here, but it doesn't seem to be working. Sorry, Jeanette. Maybe I'll hand the, the functionality back to Jeanette. Okay, so most of what I have to say, uh, you, most, uh, many of you have, of you have heard me speak before. I have two pro bono websites, one orofacialpain.org.uk and one trigeneralnerve.org.uk, set up about 15 years ago at the end of my PhD to try and um, advise patients and clinicians around prevention and management of nerve injuries. So a lot of what I have to say is available on there. Next slide, please, Jeanette. So I've structured this talk into four parts. I'm, I'm going to go through fairly quickly. Very happy to take questions at the end of all three presentations. So first of all, just give you an idea of what post-traumatic neuropathic pain is involved. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is Clifford Wolf's uh, work from 2010, who talks about the two healthy pains, which is basically pain as a symptom of disease, and then the two unhealthy pains, uh, which is basically pain as a disease in itself. And uh, the two unhealthy pains are neuropathic pain and nociplastic pain. So I'm, I'm specifically talking about no, a neuropathic pain, which by definition is a, caused, a pain caused by a lesion uh, of uh, the somatosensory uh, system, maybe peripheral or central. Um, what's interesting about neuropathic pain is that actually it may be related to some degree of repetitive um, inflammatory or nociceptive pain, multiple insults, and also very poorly managed perisurgical pain, which I'll talk about later. So there is some relationship of this uh, potentially with, uh, with nociceptive pain. Next slide, please. So when you look at the definition of the types of neuropathic pain, you can see here on the right-hand slide, uh, this is again taken uh, from a Colova's paper, which I quote quite frequently. Uh, an overview, you can see trigeminal neuralgia is included in that, post neuralgia, uh, peripheral uh, nerve injury pain, which is what I'm going to talk about, post-traumatic neuropathic pain, 
Then there's other things like amputation or fin phantom limb pain and lots of other conditions as well. So there are various recognized types of neuropathic pain. And what's very interesting about um, post-traumatic neuropathic pain is if you go to uh, clinics, uh, whether, what, whatever bodily region it might be, um, what's very interesting is in my clinic, for example, 50% of my chronic facial pain patients present with post-traumatic neuropathic pain. And uh, if, you, if you take literature from uh, limb, limb or back pain or abdominal pain clinics, breast pain clinics, or chronic pain clinics, they have uh, reported rates of 60, eight, up to 80% of patients actually present with post-traumatic neuropathic pain as the driver for the chronic pain, not a recurrent inflammatory, not mixed and not nosoplastic. And the definition really was first recognized in 1994 around when I was thinking about starting my PhD. And um, more recently we have now this uh, bona fide um, uh, criteria, which is pain caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory system, which may be peripheral or central. Next slide, please. So uh, when we look at the burden of neuropathic pain, I just told you how, how the prevalence of it is really, now it's recognized as really high. Um, and I think as in oral facial pain particularly, I think it, we're late coming to the, the stable when we actually come to um, screening our patients and diagnosing uh, neuropathic pain, and we need to do a little bit better. But the, the, the burden of this disease is significant, and I'll talk a little bit about the consequences on our particular patients. Next slide, please. So this again, another a paper take, this is Coloca, um, a very, very good overview of neuropathic pain. The pathophysiology is complex and I don't really have time to go into it, but it's probably a combination of, um, as I mentioned, uh, high level perisurgical pain. So you have high barrage of pain, possibly causing centralized sensitivity. There are also uh, peripheral sensitivity drivers. There are brain changes, gray white matter proportion, and also um, uh, as you heard from, um, uh, uh, other work that you have differential expression in, in different parts of the brain of, um, of the receptors and neuromodulators and, and neurotransmitters. So there's a combination of central peripheral and overall this either has an effect of upward facilitation of pain and or minimi mi minimizing downward modulation of pain which overall increases the pain sensitivity. Next slide please. Uh, make sure that we get our nomenclature right, and I'm very keen on this. In dentists, we often call calls neuropathy, uh, which is a which is basically a disturbance of function of a motor or sensory nerve. We call it paresthesia, which is the wrong terminology, or dysesthesia. They are terms that describe the symptoms; they are not a diagnosis. So we need to use the terminology properly. And if you have neuropathic pain, you have a demonstrable neuropathy in most patients. Um, and neuralgia is nerve pain, and also, unfortunately, it's, it's used as a diagnosis, trigeminal neuralgia. And neuritis is inflammation of the nerve. Next slide, please. So when we look at um, uh, describing neuropathic pain, what is referred to commonly in the medical literature is chronic post-surgical pain. And most of you will probably be familiar with Heinrich Kellett's work, where he uh, highlighted the fact that there are so many patients, a very, very high proportion of patients, up to 30% of patients, undergoing routine uh, general surgery, limb amputation, breast surgery, thoracotomy, and neurophys, will actually have chronic post-surgical pain as a result of the surgery. And 10% of these patients will be significantly impacted. Obviously, in dentistry, we don't seem to see this very much, even though we have a very high volume uh, patient load and surgical load in our patients. And this is probably because uh, we use local anesthetics so effectively, and this is likely causing the minimal um, barrage, afferent barrage, to the paraqueduct of the brain and the intracortex and the other areas of the brain that are involved in pain sensitization, central pain sensitization, and pain modulation. Uh, Don Nixdorf's team in America have, have, have given us a sort of uh, a, a bar level of possibly around 5% of uh, endo patients will go on to have persistent post-surgical pain in those patients, most of which is neuropathic. Next slide, please. So uh, diagnostic criteria, I'm not gonna dwell on this slide too much, but there are recognized uh, neuropathic pain diagnostic criteria worldwide. Next slide, please. Uh, and the key things around this is actually the, the chronology. So the onset of the pain is associated with some sort of traumatic event. It might be chemotherapy, might be disease onset, might be heavy metal poisoning, might be multiple cirrhosis, diabetes, could be uh, radiation, thermal induced, and of course, surgery is the most common. You do, uh, by most diagnostic uh, criteria, you have to have a neuropathic area. In chronic post-surgical pain, maybe around 15% of patients don't have that. 
and you will have positive or negative uh, findings. And though the positive findings include allodynia, maybe mechanical or thermal, and hyperalgesia, um, uh, which is a hyperesthetic presentation, a positive type um, uh, um, uh, factor. And then you have negative factors, which are things like anesthesia or non painful paresthesia, which we tend to call hyperesthetic nerve injuries. Next slide, please. So uh, ICOP, and I know Olga's going to talk about a little bit more about this later on, the International Classification of Oral Facial Pain. If you don't know about this, then you should look this up. It was published in Kepalalgia in January, and a group of us got together internationally. This is endorsed by the ICHD3, um, IASP, uh, the uh, International Headache Society, um, IADR. So a group of us got together and we, we posted a uh, different uh, 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 orofacial, chronic orofacial pain conditions. And the one I'm alluding to do today is the orofacial pain attributed to lesion of disease of cranial nerves. Uh, therein lies neuropathic pain. And this includes basically trigeminal neuralgia, post neuralgia, and post-traumatic neuropathic pain. Not burning mouth. Next slide, please. And the diagnostic criteria here, you're going to get PDFs of the lecture. I'm not going to walk, I'm going to talk you through Essentially, I've given you the overview, the onset chronology with an event, a surgical event, then the neuropathic area, demonstrable neuropathic area with or without positive and or negative signs. Next slide, please. There is a work around clustering the different types of neuropathic pain, which uh, Rolf Baron's done, and there's also Anna um, uh, uh, Nana Finnerup has led an uh, EPIC group uh, showing that actually that we can um, um, grade the neuropathic pain from possible, probable, and definite. And that is predicated on the degree of neurosensory assessment, maybe qualitative, and then quantitative neuroassessment. Next slide, please. And we obviously have to exclude secondary neuropathic pain. So we have to look at exclude nutritional deficiencies, diabetes, MS, and other conditions. Next slide, please. But most importantly, if you have a patient presenting with spontaneous sensory or motor neuropathy, you have to think in terms of neoplasia and you have to make sure that you exclude that neoplasia as a possibility of the causation of neuropathic pain. So if the patient presents to you with, without um, a, an onset chronolog chronologically timed onset with a surgical insult or um, injections, or even we see patients with um, lip fillers and dermabrasion onset with neuropathic pain, um, then they, have, they don't have that onset of that sort of um, key um, uh, event, then you may want to look and investigate further. Next, next slide, please. So who gets post-traumatic neuropathic pain? Next slide, please. Uh, well, essentially, um, there's been some really, really good papers, and these are some of the key papers I would recommend that you read. Uh, we're recognizing increasingly, not just for neuropathic, neuropathic pain, but also for nosoplastic pain, there is an element of patient vulnerability, and is that based around environmental factors? Is it based around genetics, epigenetics? Um, so, so there's increasing information now. We're recognizing the fact that actually, if we do want to do a sort of precision medicine stratified approach, we really have to holistically assess the patient and their environment to work out what that pain vulnerability might be like. And I'm going to give you an overview of what we know so far. Next slide, please. So this is a very basic slide, one that I made, um, that shows you the sort of uh, factors that we know are conducive and predictive of chronic post-surgical pain, uh, forward slash uh, neuropathic pain, post-traumatic -post neuropathic pain. So firstly, um, I'll start with surgical factors because they're fairly straightforward. The site of surgery is very important. There are certain sites in the body that seem to be more predicated developing uh, chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, the type of surgery as well, uh, but particularly the duration and then the amount of tissue retraction which probably actually results in a nerve injury, peripheral nerve injury. Um, and then the uh, perioperative um, uh, high levels of pain. So preoperative multiple episodes of pain, intraoperative high level pain and high level postoperative pain are also indicators. And the lack of use of local anesthesia is definitely a predictor. Uh, the result of nerve injury um, uh, is, is basically once it's happened, and we know I'm gonna talk about predictive predict factors about outcome from that uh, shortly. Then uh, the patient factors are probably the most important and most um, relevant. So uh, over the age of 50, uh, female patients, uh, ongoing comorbid multiple pain conditions might be chronic widespread pain, fibromyalgia, IBS, uh, TM, TMD, migraine, other some such, such conditions. And actually the axis two are probably the most important factors that we should be looking at. And these probably potentially should be factors that we, sh we should be screening in patients for elective surgery 
for perhaps dental implants, for plastic surgery and other some such uh, um, of interventions. Because these patients with mood or anxiety, depression disorders, introversion, neuroticism, hypervigilance, catastrophizing, fear of surgery, fear of pain, these are the sort of, sort of, sort of patients will probably on go to develop or are more likely to go on to develop um, uh, chronic post-surgical pain or uh, post-traumatic neuropathic pain. And it may be, and Amanda's going to touch on this, it may be the fact that they are, are more prone to be like this, part, possibly because of la, uh, life significant events, past events in their childhood. So this is a whole new area of in, uh, research. We're just certainly screening for this in our patients. Next slide, please. So obviously, the, uh, who gets the post-traumatic neuropathic pain? Well, you have to have a surgical event. And in dentistry, this is a summary unpublished of around, um, I think there's around 600 patients. Um, and uh, you can see here that the most common uh, presentation post-surgical uh, neuropathic uh, disorder was caused by thermal surgery, for both lingual nerve injuries and inferior alveolar nerve injuries on your, on your left. And you can see here that the inferior alveolar nerve is also um, liable to injury from implants and endo, but the lingual nerve is, is mainly around LA and thermal surgery. Next slide. Um, and uh, predictive patient factors, as I've mentioned already, they come up again and again and again in different site surgery. This is actually a paper, a review around children, which is unusual to see chronic post surgical pain in children. But you can see here that the, that the medical factors um, and the, the biological, the demographic uh, factors and the access to factors are very important in the, in the, risk, in the risk of developing uh, post-traumatic neuropathic pain. Next slide, please. Um, and this is Katz and Selsa, a seminal paper, again, looking at chronic post-surgical pain. So I'm sort of mudding the water a little bit, incorporating that, but we're, there's a recognition that probably around between 30 and 80% of chronic post-surgical pain patients, these are very large volume studies. Uh, but you can see here that the access to is really, really key in the risk for the patient going on to um, uh, chronic post-surgical pain or post-traumatic neuropathic pain. Next slide, please. And this is very politically incorrect, but I, I do present it at most of my lectures. Uh, Ramesh will have heard this before. I talk about two types of patients. I talk about rugby type patients who can score a try, break a bone, they just get on with their lives. They seem to be very resilient. They have a lot of coping strategy. And then the next slide, please. The other type of patient is a soccer type patient. And excuse the wimps, again, politically incorrect, but obviously these patients have very little coping. They're very fragile. And, and I train my dental students and my trainees about on the pain clinic, trying to, trying to convert football type patients into rugby type patients, trying to move them on into improving their coping and their understanding of their condition and, and moving on. Next slide, please. So WIMPs is not, not so horrible, but um, we've got uh, women, and obviously a gene-wide expression analysis of propensity for uh, post-traumatic neuropathic pain. We've got um, uh, inhibition and injury. Injury is a key part of obviously the onset of, of neuropathic, post-traumatic neuropathic pain. Again, the access to personality disorders, mood disorders, prior abuse and neglect, which Amanda's going to talk more about. And don't forget sleep. Sleep is the free drug that we all abuse as medical fraternity. Um, it's the biggest healer that we have that's totally free of charge. But certainly lack of sleep is a massive proponent for um, uh, vulnerability to uh, chronic pain. Next slide, please. Uh, William Maxner, a couple of review studies have shown um, about, about, I mentioned right at the outset, about the external factors, the environmental factors, epigenetics, genetics, that may be um, pushing patients towards developing chronic post-surgical pain and post-traumatic neuropathic pain. Next slide, please. And uh, this is a very good paper. Again, uh, Nana Finnerup and um, uh, uh, David Bennett, who I'm very privileged to work with, um, some work on neuropathic pain and some of the genetic um, findings, uh, sort of candidate genes that may be interested in uh, looking for neuropathic pain. Next slide, please. So uh, Amanda's gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on this, but this is a big, I'm a big proponent. We actually access to screen our patients to death, practically. They have a long uh, um, uh, habit they have to fill in before they see us on clinic. Uh, and I'm very, very interested in the significant past life events, particularly around the onset of pain, but also in childhood. Next slide, please. So uh, why prevent post-traumatic neuropathy? I'm just gonna briefly tell you about how my patients present to me and why I'm so desperate to stop this happening. This is a video that you can't hear. It's a lovely lady, 33 year old mother of three, who had an endodontic treatment. You can see here on the lower right six, and usually in the NHS dentistry, she was offered an endo rather than extraction. 
She went through the endo and in the middle of the procedure, she had terrible high level pain uh, because she had a chemical leak through the distal um, apex and the uh, large apical area allowed that chemical, these nasty chemicals, pH is between 12 and 14, to go straight into the pheroidental canal and cause very high level funny bone pain in the middle of the procedure. She went on to have a neuropathic pain that persisted, a neuropathic area on her lip, um, all around her gums and teeth, the whole um, uh, sort of distal proportion, neurologically speaking, all of this area was painful. Over the next 18 months, she went on to have multiple procedures, endo, re-endo extraction of all the teeth in her lower quadrant, and now has a full denture replacing the teeth in that lower quadrant, which is the patients we see again and again. This is a young dentist treating a patient with neuropathic pain as an inflammatory pain type patient. So we must make sure we don't miss this diagnosis. Next slide, please. Uh, and the most patients, so um, uh, I've now, we've now analyzed and talk, some work, talk about some work uh, that I've jointly done with uh, Frederick van der Krusen, who is a PhD student, Max Back, um, trainee surgeon in, in Leuven University, who I'm very fortunate to co-supervise his PhD. We put together an analysis of 1,331 nerve injury patients, and um, about 60% of those patients present with neuropathic pain, about 58%. In my cohort, previously published, it was 70% if you look at all the different causes uh, together. So neuropathic pain is a very common feature we see in these patients. Um, obviously, they're avoidable and negligent, particularly elective surgery around implant surgery. Uh, they're mainly permanent, so endo and implant nerve injuries are 95-98% likely to be permanent, as well as painful. And also the pain drives the associated functional disability, uh, psychological disability, and social disability, which is really prevalent in these patients. Next slide, please. Is this because of the region? Because the trigeminal nerve is a sensory guardian angel for all these functions in life that we love doing, eating, speaking, smiling, sexual interactions, kissing our partners. So every time you get a listed pain, you have ongoing neuropathic pain in that region that's caused by the dentist, that really messes with your mind and messes with your life, your ability to move on. Next slide, please. Uh, thanks to Frederick, this is in press. Uh, this is some Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, survival curves, and you can see here on the left-hand side the initi initiating event. If, it's, if the nerve injury is related to local anesthesia or thermal or surgery, then you're more likely to have recovery, more likely lo local anesthetic. We know about 75% of those recover. Uh, and certainly um, uh, less of those recover in related to thermal or surgery. And the lingual nerve, interesting, the type of nerve uh, probably recovers better than the mandibular nerve uh, rather than the maxillary nerve. And then the sensory profile, uh, unfortunately from our, our poor patients with this condition, is if they have um, hyposthesia, so they have um, sensory loss uh, without pain, they're much more likely to recover than those poor patients who have ongoing um, allodynia, either thermal or mechanical allodynia. Next slide, please. And the predictive factors for resolution were, as I mentioned, the type of surgery. So local anesthetic was most likely to recover, thermal or surgery second most likely to recover, but implant and endo related injuries do not really recover. Um, EQ5D of low pain, so sort of a quality of life, basic quality of life questionnaire, Lingual nerve was more likely to recover than the um, mandibular and maxillary nerve, and sensory loss without pain patients that we clustered them. I'll show you in the next slide. There's one third cluster into that group. So, so that was the predictor's recovery. So it's bad news for these poor mechanical hyperalgesia and the thermal hyperalgesia groups. Um, but what's really, really reassuring about this clustering that Frederick's undertaken with the, with the 1,331 patients is this actually mirrors exactly what uh, Rolf Baron's group managed to look at in the German Neuropathic Network group, where they, I think it was around 11,000 patients they assessed with all different types of neuropathic pain, and they clustered in exactly the same way. So we're talking about the same disease. Next slide, please. Um, of course, uh, just consequences, uh, the functional problems, I won't dwell on this, but eating, shaving, speaking, uh, and it's definitely predominantly pain. We do have the odd patient with complete anesthesia and numbness who can't cope and have difficulty function, that's understandable, but the pain generally drives functional disability. Next slide, please. And then the psychological consequences, which is partly what's driven our large psych screen that we do. So we do uh, quite a complex, I haven't included in this presentation, but I can talk to anyone about it if they want to know more, uh, including sleep and prior abuse and neglect, but we do quite a, a, a large screen of, of, uh, of access to. Um, we work with clinical psychologists team who are the key members of actually managing this patient group. Because as you can imagine, neuropathic pain does not respond to surgery, 
uh, has mixed response to medications, all of which have significant side effects. Only 18% of our patients actually adhere to the drug regime that we recommend for their, which may be either nortriptyl or pregabalin or a, a, a duloxetine. So those are the drugs we tend to use and the patients often don't tolerate it very well. Next slide, please. And then of course, I'm not going to talk about the lawyers, um, but obviously medical legal consequences is a biggie. Next slide, please. So last but not least, how to prevent these nerve injuries. And this is a very, very quick view of how to prevent nerve injuries in relation to dental procedures. Next slide, please. So uh, overall, the most important thing is around managing patients' expectations. Consent doesn't, let pre doesn't actually per se prevent nerve injuries, but the patients who have been properly consented, like the orthognathic patients who are half expecting, there's an 18% persistence inferior alveolar nerve neuropathy after bilateral sagittal split osteotomy. Those patients have been so well managed and so well consented they're sort of expecting it to happen and just maybe slightly relieved when it doesn't happen. So uh, the consent process is really important in helping us manage the patients if they get the nerve injuries. Risk assessment is absolutely core. So the preoperative risk assessment is where you're going to prevent these nerve injuries. It's less about the operative technique unless you're talking about third molar surgery. Uh, Post-op follow-up follow is absolutely crucial for endo and implant nerve injuries. You have to do it within 24 to 30 hours to maximize getting the implant out or getting the root canal tooth out um, to um, in, in massively improve the recovery of that nerve. You, after that window of 30 hours, basically you just treat the patient like a chronic pain patient. Uh, and as I've mentioned, the recognition of neuropathic pain needs to be improved in dentistry. And it's not really our fault. We weren't really taught about this very much, but that's changing now. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to run through briefly, local anesthesia, how do we, uh, local dental implants, endodontic third molar. So uh, next slide, please, Jeanette, thank you for this. So uh, a very busy slide. Uh, you're going to have the PDF so you can read it. And uh, uh, there are separate lectures actually on the website, specifically around local anesthesia nerve injuries, implant, endo, and third molar nerve injuries. So the risk factors effectively block injection. So you all know when you go to anesthetist, uh, you can have a spinal or epidural injection. The anesthetist will warn you there's a 1 in 57 57,000 chance of a persistent motor or sensory neuropathy after a, a block. They are trained in a specific way, so they do not stick needles near nerves. They use ultrasound, they use all the mechanism, mechanisms they can, so that their needle does not go near the nerve. And in dentistry, we are doing that incorrectly. We are still teaching our students mainly to block injections and mainly to go close to the needle. You do not need to do that. The inferior dental block is, a, is, a, is a not a great injection. The pulpal anesthesia rate is really poor. You have to wait 10 minutes minimum for maximum pulpal um, anesthesia. And, um, and that, uh, in 8% of patients, they need 20 minutes to get optimal pulpal anesthesia after the inferior dental block. So unless you're recurrently doing uh, endo or complex prosthodontics on lower mandibular sevens and eights, you do not need to be routinely giving block injections. And the next slide will show you, but don't go to the next slide yet. Multiple injections is also a risk factor, but we know that uh, from Ken Hargreaves' work uh, that if you repeat your inferior dental block, you don't get an improved outcome. It's actually about waiting for 10 minutes. Uh, infiltration, uh, buccal infiltration, uh, adjunctive injections will help, not another inferior dental block. Type and concentration, we know that high concentration uh, agents like mefibicane, prilocaine, articane 4%, definitely are more neurotoxic than 2% lidocaine. Um, and the extreme pain, and bupivacaine is the most neurotoxic of all the agents. And then if you have a patient who has funny bone pain, extreme pain during injection, Smith and Lung in 86 reported that 60% uh, of his patients will go on to have a persistent neuropathy the following day. And as I've mentioned, 75% of those will recover. Next slide, please. So I've, it's a, a busy slide, but I'm not gonna dwell on it, but it basically explains to you that you can do all of maxillary dentistry with lidocaine, you only use articane infiltration dentistry in the mandibles, 3.4 times more effective than lidocaine. Um, and you probably only need to give an inferior dental block for seven and eight um, complex prosthodontics uh, or endo. And rarely in a lower um, six, it doesn't respond to articane infiltration with lingual um, uh, lidocaine infiltration. Next slide, please. So how about dental implants? I can't believe we're going through this so quickly, but it's a synopsis. So hopefully give you a taste of how we can prevent these nerve injuries. Next slide, please. Uh, so implants, we've done published a fair bit on this. Uh, unsurprisingly, patients around 47 years old, that's when you expect them to have implant in mandibular implants. Predominantly they're in the parasympathetic region, so premolar um, and first molar region. Uh, undoubtedly, um, uh, the supposition or evidence that the injury occurs during the implant bed preparation, 
And this is not a great surprise because they rec uh, the implant societies recommend a two millimeter safety zone when you're planning your implants. Um, and clearly um, uh, the, the complexity of the parasympathetic the mental foramen anatomy, neuroanatomy is really complex. But even back here, if you have a two millimeter um, in the, in the five or six region, a two millimeter safety zone, your implant drill in most systems is 1.5 millimeters longer than your implant. So you're essentially planning with a 0.5 millimeter safety zone, which is completely inappropriate, particularly when most patients, um, dentists are planning their implants based on, uh, on panorals, which obviously there's an element, a large element of, of uh, magnification. So, so my, one of my key recommendations is that you should be using short implants and a minimum of four millimeter safety zone. So long implants, and then of course, the same old intraoperative funny bone pain, you've gone too close to the nerve, the nerve complains, even though the patient's fully anesthetized with a local anesthetic, stop what you're doing and reassess. Next slide, please. So again, this summarizes the risk factors for implant nerve injury. Poor planning is definitely, definitely the key factor. Um, uh, dentists, we did surveys around dentists, can they read the CBCTs? Many of them can't, they were asking the radiographer or the restorative dentist to tell them where the nerve board is completely inappropriate. The computerized software doesn't really um, uh, give you much benefit to preventing nerve injury. I think it actually lulls a lot of conditions into false security. Uh, but essentially poor technique, interoperative technique, even if they've planned it well, is not gonna help. And of course, again, like endo nerve injuries, you have 24 to 30, 30 hours to review your patient, qualify they have a neuropathic area and neuropathic pain, and get the implant out uh, to maximize resolution. Next slide, please. Uh, so this, again, summarizes the evidence, but I can't strengthen enough. The key is around enough safety zone, uh, not forgetting that the implant drill is longer than the implant in nearly all implant systems. So short implants, and the evidence is mixed around computer-guided surgery, surgical guides. Uh, ITI make a re recommendation you stop 60% of your planned uh, implant drilling depth, reassess with a surgical guide in to see actually where you are, which I think is a really good idea. And also using short implants is a no-brainer. Next slide, please. Uh, endodontics, next slide, please. So essentially, endo is a little bit like um, pre-op assessing uh, implants and thermolar surgery. So what we found in our uh, cohort of about 30 nerve injury patients we've published in the Australian um, Endodontic Journal um, a couple of years ago, that the key risk factor of endodontic nerve injury is the apex sitting on the inferior, close to the inferior uh, canal. And you can see here there's overfill, there's over instrumentation, overfill, all because there's been a loss of apical seal, the tooth apex is right on the inferior dental canal and obviously the nerve is affected. Now what you can't see on any of these, and this would be a good example here, is that if you have a tooth or here, the tooth that's had an endo done, you can't see an overfill, you can't see an over in, in, uh, instrumentation, but you can see that the patient has a nerve injury. This is due to chemical leakage through the um, apex, open apex. And the chemicals used in endodontics are absolutely um, hostile to nerve tissue. They're, 12 to 14 pH. They will just fry or burn nerve tissue. Next slide, please. And as I've mentioned previously, the most endodontic like implant nerve injuries are very painful, very high levels, 95% uh, neuropathic pain rate and 98% uh, likely to be permanent. So the key thing is around risk assessment of the proximity of the tooth to the ID canal. Uh, maybe generalists shouldn't be doing root canal uh, treatments in those teeth. Maybe the specialists uh, would maybe do a shortened, um, a shortened prep and maximize the apical plugs. So there's no uh, chemical leakage in those teeth. I'm not an endodontist, I, I can't suggest it, but there needs to be some um, mitigating uh, design in the um, application of the endo to minimize nerve injury. Next slide, please. And last but not least, ah, so, that, so that's what I've talked about. So risk assessment in, in endo. Uh, next slide, please. And last but not least is third molar surgery, which uh, is my favorite subject. It pains me that I've been such a short presentation. Thanks to Nat. So next slide, please. So obviously the third molars are close to two nerves, lingual nerves and inferior alveolar nerves. This is a summary of evidence-based risk factors around lingual nerve injury and inferior alveolar nerve injury. They're two different things in a way because lingual nerve injury is really a down, is technique sensitive. It's about doing good third molar surgery and not going anywhere near the region with the lingual nerve in. However, the inferior alveolar nerve is more about the anatomy of the patient. It's the proximity of the roots of the inferior dental canal containing the inferior alveolar nerve 
to those thermolar roots. Next slide, please. And this is a slide uh, taken here. You can see on the left-hand side, there's an elevated thermolar. You can see the lingual nerve sitting there. Between uh, 11 and 18% of patients have lingual nerves literally sitting, hugging the lingual aspect of your thermolar. So obviously, if you are doing distal bone removal, you're playing with fire because you're going to be very, very close with the drill to that nerve. And when I go in and do my lingual nerve expirations, which I rarely do these days because I've already told you that neuropathic pain does not respond to surgery, unfortunately, I find a big dint in the lingual plate where the drill has been and a, and, a, and a very damaged lingual nerve. Next slide, please. So the key factor around the technique of minimizing nerve injury is not to go distally of the tooth. So this is incorrect. You don't retract the tissues at all. You don't do the old fashioned explode the patient and remove the tooth. You implode the tooth uh, uh, and not explode the patient. So you do very, you can see here, this is the buckle technique. So very minimal access, fissure burr, removing buckle bone and splitting the tooth into small parts and taking the tooth out. So you're essentially not going anywhere near the lingual nerve region. Next slide, please. And this is some clinical slides here, just here. Very, I don't do any uh, envelope flaps, no large uh, extensions distally. You don't need to because you're not removing distal bone. Very small triangular flap, which is better, less pain, less swelling, less likely to, to um, affect the, the insertion of the temporalis and get trismus. And basically you can see just a section of the tooth, elevate the tooth with very minimal access. Next slide, please. And the start of the inferior alveolar nerve injury, you'll all be familiar if you're oral surgeons or you do routine dentistry, you see these teeth well and truly into and crossing the ID canal. Uh, next slide, please. If these teeth have associated plain radiographic films that have been published since the 1960s, particularly diversion of the canal, darkening the root and interruption of the laminar dura of the canal, then you know that the risk, next slide, please, to uh, removing that tooth is 10 times more than actually removing an, a non high risk tooth. So instead of having 0.2% permanent, you have 2% permanent, and instead of 2% temporary, you have 20% temporary nerve injury. So next slide, please. How can we mitigate this? Well, using chromium CT scans for those of us who have access to it. If not, you can offer your patient just a cor cor coronectomy. Uh, if it's a healthy tooth and a healthy patient, you can offer them the coronectomy based on a plain film. But if you have a chromium CT scan, you can look up for these additional risk factors. But my main risk factor is basically either the tooth, the, the nerve is running through the tooth, this poor patient is too late for this poor patient, the, the tooth is out and the nerve is sectioned. Uh, so preoptive chromium CT scan will allow you to see this yellow nerve here is literally winding between the roots of the tooth. And that's what we more commonly see in the Western world, this sort of interradicular nerve intertwining. And if I feel I can't unwind that tooth from that nerve, then I will do a coronectomy. Next slide, please. In a sensible patient that understands what you're saying, it's actually quite complex consult, uh, consenting patients for coronectomy because there's complications that can happen intraoperative, early postoperative, and late postoperative. And sometimes patients wonder what on earth you're suggesting to them. If the tooth is non vital, you have to go ahead and section the tooth and take it out anyway. Or if the patient's uh, diabetic or has a compromised immunity, the coronectomy is a really good way of minimizing nerve injury in high risk nerve rollers. But I only do it if the chromium CT scans, uh, if you have access, that show that there is a probably in about four out of 100 patients I do coronectomies and ideally it would be two, it's not the 2% that get the nerve injury, but you can prevent the nerve injury using that technique. Next slide, please. And this is just again some basic clinical slides showing, uh, and again, these are mainly on my websites, but minimal access, buckle bone removal, and the key thing around the coronectomy is get all the enamel out, leave the pulp alone, don't play with it, don't treat with it, don't cap it, nothing, and you get primary repair, primary closure. Next slide, please. So in a nutshell, and I hope I haven't overrun my time too much, um, it, prevention of uh, nerve injuries uh, in relation to dental procedures and the related very high level neuropathic pain we've seen as patients is essential and possible. It's around patient selection and I'm very keen uh, looking at for elective surgery about access to screening for these patients, their uh, chronic pain, uh, comorbidity, headaches, back pain, fibromyalgia, chronic respiratory pain. Obviously, age and females are over 50 and females are more uh, uh, predisposed to chronic prosthetic volume or PTMP. Good planning risk assessment is absolutely key. Good surgical technique is, uh, is, is, will optimize uh, minimal uh, tissue damage and minimal nerve injury. Managing the patient's expectations. I've talked about the orthognathic patients. We, don't, we can't fix these nerve injuries once they've happened, unfortunately. We have to help the nerve get better by itself, but we cannot fix them. Uh, so, so don't think, you know, the, the patients that end up really on our clinics as chronic pain patients. Don't sit and wait for resolution. We had this old anathema in dentistry that we wait for 12 weeks. That's purely based on the old-fashioned thermal surgery 
lingual abscess thermal surgery and lingual nerve injuries that were predominantly temporary, about 88 to 90 percent of those injuries would get better in 12 weeks. That does not apply, I hope I've made this clear, that does not apply to any other nerve injuries in relation to dentistry. And home checking your patients will keep you out of jail. So ring up your patients the next day, checking that they haven't got any persistent pain or um, at, at allodynia or nerve or numb area and get them back and assess them within 24 hours, particularly the endo and the, uh, and the implant, uh, no, uh, implant treat, treatment patients. Uh, next slide, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry, it was a very swift overview, uh, but hopefully I've set the picture. I'm a very, very, very strong proponent that in dentistry, we know we see a very high volume number of patients do high volume surgery. We can prevent a significant amount of neuropathic pain in our patients with just some basic advice and some basic um, guidance. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tara. Um, lots of positive comments have come through. Um, before I introduce Olga, uh, just just very quickly, there, 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 there are a few things about um, whether the handouts are gonna be available. It's my understanding the handout will be available. Um, the other thing, if you've got questions, if you could just place them directly in the Q&A section rather than uh, messaging me directly or the panelists directly so it's all sort of organised at the end, um, please keep in mind um, there are literally um, 640 plus participants on this and I doubt I'll get to every question but I'll, I'll try and answer, we'll try and answer as many as we can. Um, now to introduce Olga. Olga will be speaking on updates in orofacial pain. Olga is an instructor in the Department of Diagnostic Sciences at Rutgers School of Dental Medicine, um, Newark, New Jersey in the US. Her current research interests include investigating molecular mechanisms contributing to neuropathic pain development and maintenance, as well as sex dimorphism of pain. She collaborates with a team of researchers to investigate the predictive value of exercise-induced hypoalgesia profile in rats on pain intensity inflicted by peripheral nerve injury. Um, um, Olga is an ad hoc reviewer for peer-reviewed journals. She's involved in various professional committees and gives lectures in, orofacial pain, in the orofacial pain program at Rutgers School of Dental Medicine. Um, Olga, over to you. Thank you, Ramesh. And uh, hello, everybody, and thank you all for joining this webinar session. Uh, let me see if I can control. Okay, I can control the slide. Perfect. So. This year has been very exciting for the field of orofacial pain. In March um, of this year, orofacial pain has been recognized as the 12th specialty by American Dental Association. And as Tara mentioned, international classification of pain was published in January in cephalalgia. And just to uh, remind everybody, it's a multi-professional international initiative to establish comprehensive classification of orofacial pain and is the first internationally accepted classification that deals with orofacial pain. So before we talk about orofacial pain and prevention, I think it's very important to define orofacial pain. While anatomically the face is clearly part of the head, anatomical boundaries of facial pain have been debated and International, uh, International Headache Society defines facial pain as pain below the orbital middle line anterior to the pinna and above the neck and other definitions include the forehead. While orofacial pain includes all the structures of the oral cavity. At the same time, headache is often referred to orofacial regions and vice versa, and headaches located exclusively within the orofacial regions and orofacial pains that are referred to the head present complex clinical phenotypes with significant diagnostic difficulties. ICOP is the first classification of orofacial pain that was based on a principle that the characteristics of the disorder and not their location, head versus face, should guide the diagnostic criteria. It is also very important to define what is considered chronic for orofacial pain. In general, chronicity is defined as uh, pain lasting for more than three months. However, this definition is not sufficient for orofacial pain disorders as it does not take in, into account the frequency and duration of the attacks. And therefore, in orofacial pain and headache, chronicity is defined as pain occurring on more than 15 days per month and lasting for more than two hours per day for at least the last three months. Correct classification of orofacial pain is important for treatment approaches 
and adequate timely treatment is crucial in preventing chronification of pain. Based on ICOP, orofacial pain has been classified in these following six uh, categories. And uh, based on the frequency and severity of uh, orofacial pain disorders, um, I mean, because frequency and severity of orofacial pain disorders vary widely, the ICOP diagnostic criteria do not include routine assessment of severity and frequency. However, it is recommended that frequency and severity be assessed and specified. So to be able to prevent pain, we have to be able to identify individuals at risk for developing chronic pain, including chronic orofacial pain. It is well known that uh, gender is one of the factors affecting pain. Women are at greater risk for most common uh, chronic pain conditions, including migraine, tension type headache, fibromyalgia, and temporomandibular disorders. The magnitude of sex difference varies considerably across studies across uh, pain measures and stimulus modalities, but the direction of the difference is highly consistent. Uh, additionally, women show greater temporal summation of pain and less conditioned pain modulation, suggesting that a pain modulatory balance is tuned more towards uh, pain facilitation than pain inhibition among women. Age is another factor influencing pain and patterns of pain prevalence across the lifespan are complex and they vary across pain conditions and this figure just shows the examples of um, prevalence patterns for several chronic pain conditions across lifespan. And for example, the prevalence of joint pain, lower extremity pain, neuropathic pain tends to increase monotonically with age. General chronic pain increases in prevalence until middle age, at which time point the prevalence plateaus. And pain conditions such as headache, abdominal pain, back pain, chest pain, show peak prevalence in the third to fifth decades of life after which the frequency decreases. Results from the studies on age-related changes in response to experimental pain suggest that older adults show less sensitivity to brief cutaneous pains. However, sensitivity to more sustained pain stimuli that impact deeper tissue increases with age. Also, several studies demonstrated increased temporal summation of pain among older adults, while conditioned pain modulation has been shown to decrease with age suggesting that aging is associated with a shift in pain modulatory balance, such, this all, such that older adults um, show enhanced pain facilitation combined with decreased pain inhibition. Genetics is another factor influencing pain. It is important in determining the risk of the chronic condition itself and also the co-occurrence of other disabilities. And given the reported heritability of chronic pain between 16 and 50%, a substantial proportion of risk of developing chronic pain condition is driven by genetic background. Genomic revolution and the promise of uh, precision medicine spiked interest in individual differences in pain, and numerous genetic factors have been identified for migraine, muscle skeletal pain, neuropathic pain, visceral pain conditions, and among these migraine and muscle skeletal pain disorders have been investigated the most extensively and therefore accumulated the highest number of uh, implicated genetic variants. And I lost the control of switching slides. Oh, there you go, thank you. So taking all of these factors together uh, makes the experience of pain highly variable between individuals and perhaps the simplest manifestation of inter-individual differences is that an experimental stimulus delivered at the standardized intensity elicits subjective pain reports that vary dramatically between individuals. The mean pain rating in this study of uh, 321 healthy young adults was 71.8, but ratings ranged from four to 100 on a scale from zero to 100, zero meaning no pain and 100 meaning maximum pain. Such individual differences also emerge in the clinic environment. We know that, for example, pain reports following the same surgical procedure vary greatly across patients. Uh, genetic plays a role not only in the risk of developing chronic pain, but also in treatment responses. And recent review looked at the clinically actionable polymorphisms in genes encoding uh, cytochrome P450-2D6 enzyme and mu one opioid receptor gene. And the results of this review suggest that the patients can be classified in three broad, broad risk categories for opioid side effects and dependency, 
And based on their uh, CYP2D6 and OPRM1 genotypes, they can be classified into uh, high risk, medium risk, and low risk. These results show that uh, genetic factors can help determine why some patients seem more vulnerable than others to opioid side effects and dependency. So additionally, evidence clearly supports the importance of the biopsychosocial model, which is crucial for understanding the complexity of pain processing in general and in relation to orofacial pain disorders. Biopsychosocial model is a complex, dynamic, and multidirectional model, meaning it looks at how biological, psychological, and social factors can influence pain and how pain affects all the other factors. Underpinning of the biopsychosocial model is the patient-centered care, which involves incorporating the patient's perspective as part of the therapeutic process. Understanding of the unique mosaic of factors contributing to inter-individual differences in pain experience and incorporating them into the assessment and diagnosis is critically important in order to provide optimal treatment plan and hopefully identify individuals at risk for developing chronic pain, including chronic orofacial pain. Uh, a recent two-arm randomized trial tested a telephone cognitive behavioral therapy against usual care for prevention of chronic widespread pain. And this is just an example of how uh, say, psychosocial intervention can be used to manage pain. The results from this trial indicate that telephone cognitive behavioral therapy was effective in chronic widespread pain management, and majority of patients reported positive changes in subjective level of pain and some attributed the positive change directly to the intervention as a result of empowerment, increased self-management, and cognitive restructuring. So another approach to pain prevention, especially the post-surgical pain, is uh, prevent preemptive analgesia. And literature on the effects of preemptive analgesia on post-surgical pain is very vast and provides evidence that preemptive analgesia is effective in controlling post-operative pain. And these are just a few examples of the recently published studies on the effectiveness of preemptive analgesia in post-surgical pain. And for example, preoperative pre uh, sublingual pyroxicum was shown to be effective in controlling post-operative pain and swelling after surgical implant placement. And results from the um, recent double-blind randomized trial show that show efficacy of preoperative ropivacaine on post-operative pain following third molar extractions. So can we prevent muscle and TMJ pain? Possibly in the future, results from animal research suggest that suppression of the trigeminal ganglion hyperactivity using designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs uh, results in alleviation of pain induced by intraorbital nerve injury and suppresses the CFOS expression in the subnucleus podalis. Therefore, dreads offer a possibility of injections into the TG4 from trigeminally injured subjects. Future holds the promise that new mechanism-based drugs will be developed that are not symptom-modifying drugs that simply mask the problem as we have now, but they will be a mechanism-based disease-modifying drugs that will go right into the root of the problem and attack specific cells and proteins that cause the central nervous system windup or plasticity that distorts and amplifies the sensory experience of pain. And thank you very much for, to, to everybody for attention. Thank you, Olga. Thank you for that presentation. Um, just um, the, a, couple, a couple of lovely comments about your presentation. Thank you for those comments. Um, before we move on to um, Amanda, um, there were questions about whether this will be recorded, always being recorded, and whether the recording will be available, and I can confirm that it is being recorded and um, um, it'll be um, available. Um, moving on now to our final speaker, Dr. Amanda Punyuan, who'll be, um, who, um, who's be speaking on, the on who, whose title is A Bad Tooth or a Sad Thru Truth. Bit of a tongue twister there, Amanda. Um, Amanda is an oral medicine specialist in Perth, Western Australia. She works in private practice and has a public appointment at the Oral Health Centre of Western Australia. Her research interests include the use of visual illusions in burning mouth syndrome patients, temporomandibular joint disorders, oral mucosal disease, dental sleep medicine and paediatric oral medicine. 
She's the editor and examiner for the Royal Australasian College of Dental Surgeons, treasurer of the Australian Dental Association, West, um, the West Australian branch, and is heavily involved with various professional com committees. She's passionate about her specialty, um, regularly lecturing and running oral medicine interest pages and dental forums, as well as teaching at the University of Western Australia. Over to you, Amanda. Thank you very much. So I'll give it a go at trying to run the screen. I think there may, may be a slight delay. So if everyone can just bear with me while I click that. There we go. So I thought I would introduce oral medicine in case some of our listeners were not aware of what oral medicine actually is. So it is a dental specialty and we see medically complex patients, oral mucosal disease like white patches, rape patches, oral cancer, potentially malignant disease, dental sleep medicine, radiographic findings, and of course, temporomandibular joint disorders and headaches. One of my favorite things about oral medicine is that we're quite a tight knit community uh, worldwide. And I had a quick look through the list of participants later uh, before and I saw some familiar names there. So thank you everyone for joining us. So I would like to start off the presentation by telling you about Debbie, who was one of my patients. She is a 17 year old female who was referred for oral facial pain in the head and neck region. Her father came to the appointment with her. Now her medical history was significant for type two diabetes for which she was taking metformin, obesity for which she was taking fentamine, and she was under investigation for, for pelvic pain. She is a never smoker, doesn't consume any alcohol. When I was taking a psychosocial, oh, I skipped forward one. Okay, I don't know how I can go back. But when I was taking the psychosocial history, um, there was nothing significant disclosed. However, from her body language, I could tell that there was something a little bit more. So I asked her father to wait in the waiting room. And it was then that she disclosed sexual abuse by her father's friend when she was 14. She also told me that her parents were aware of the situation. The case was reported to the authorities. However, there was no outcome. Now, this patient's name was Debbie. But it could have been Susan, it could have been Sharon, it could have been Mariam, it could have been David, it could have been Michael, it could have been Anthony. My point is that if you are treating chronic pain patients, this is one of your patients because her case, sadly, is not unusual. So let's explore some of the how, what and why behind childhood adversity and the impact on oral facial pain. So the first question is how common are these adverse childhood experiences? To answer that question, one of the big landmark studies in the area is the ACE study, and they looked at almost 17,000 patients. What ACE, there we go. So I actually found these statistics very shocking. So one in seven people would have experienced child neglect or abuse. So there were over a thousand people who registered for this webinar. To put that into context, about 150 of those people would have experienced child neglect or abuse and or abuse. And this number is also likely to be an underrepresentation. The other interesting thing that came up from the ACE study is that this does not necessarily affect who you think it does. So when I tell you about people who have experienced child neglect and abuse, you might be thinking of the financially unstable, the ethnic, or the uneducated. The ACE study, the average age of their patients was 57 years old, 80% were Caucasian, most were middle class, and 75% were college educated. So this is you or me, this is our colleagues, this is our friends, this is our community. Sorry, um, I think it's frozen. There we go. So the A study had 10 questions and it was broken down into abuse, neglect and household dysfunction. So hopefully everyone who is listening at the moment has a pen or paper where they were taking down questions. And as we go through these 10 questions, give yourself one point if it does, if your answer is yes. So prior to your 18th birthday, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you may be physically hurt? Did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you, or have you touched their body in a sexual way, or attempt or actually have oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse with you? Did you often or very often feel that 
No one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other. Did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you, or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you needed it? Were your parents ever separated or divorced? Was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her? or sometimes often or very often kick, bitten, hit with a fist or hit with something hard or ever repeatedly hit over at least a few minutes or threatened with a gun or knife? Did you ever live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or used street drugs? Was a household member depressed or mentally ill or did a household member attempt suicide? Did a household member go to prison? Now add up your yes answers and this is your ACE score. So ACEs are unfortunately common. You can see here that out of the ACE study, 26% had one ACE and 12.5% had four or more. Now this is out of the scope of this lecture, but if you have an ACE score of four or more, you are at significantly higher risk of many mental health and bodily health conditions. Now in the context of oral facial pain, how is childhood adversity actually affected, associated? Does childhood adversity accumulate and prime an individual to be, later, to be vulnerable later in life? Or could early life adversity set an individual off on an unfavorable life trajectory from which they accumulate and develop susceptibilities to certain pain conditions? Could there be a biological programming effect where childhood adversity could lead a child to be less able to cope with later life stresses? Or could a history of adversity increase vulnerability to emotional distress and increase the tendency to attend, amplify, or overinterpret somatic symptoms. Well, unfortunately, one plus one does not equal two in this case. The connection of the type of adversity to clinical and psychosocial variables does remain unclear. And similarly, there is an unclear relationship between when the adversity occurs and if or when chronic pain will manifest. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation as well. Does the pain actually drive the psychological symptoms or vice versa? And I will put to you in this case, does it, does it really matter? Well, that's a bit frustrating, you might be thinking. So why don't we know more? Well, simply put, this is very hard to study. There are inherent difficulties in looking at these patients. The very nature of chronic pain is insidious. There is often not a specific time of disease onset. And we may not have independent confirmation of these adverse childhood exposures. And in the people who report them, there may be a recall bias. While there are many unknowns, it is clear that associations have been found between childhood adversity and chronic pain states, including fibromyalgia, headache, migraine, irritable bowel syndrome, interstitial cystitis, endometriosis, vulvodynia, chronic pelvic pain, PTSD, systemic assertion intolerance disease, and temporomandibular joint disorders. Both Tara and Olga have talked on these comorbid conditions as well. So when looking at the literature specifically for temporomandibular joint disorders, this study from 1997 looked at 58 female TMD subjects and they had 39 H matched controls. A greater percentage of TMD subjects reported a history of physical abuse. This was greater, but not statistically significant. Uh, significant. They found that the prevalence of sexual abuse among TMD subjects to be similar to that of other chronic pain populations. And there was a higher proportion of patients with temporomandibular disorders who disclosed a history of sexual or, and or physical abuse. This study in 2000 looked at 114 women with TMD. Sorry, I've lost that slide, but let me just tell you what it said. So that study looked at 114 women with TMD and they had, and among those with a history of physical abuse, those with a history of physical abuse reported significantly more pain than those who reported a history of sexual abuse or no abuse at all. So this study was interesting because they didn't find that people who were sexually abused had were more prevalent in the population with TMD. Now, 
Now, this study by Riley et al. in 1998 looked at 139 patients, subjects with TMD. And this is, this is really significant. 49% of them had a history of physical and or sexual abuse. That's almost 50%. And the abused subjects reported significantly higher levels of anxiety, depression, and somatic symptoms than non-abused subjects. This study looked at 2,011 year old children and followed them up for three years. And they wanted to find out if there were predictors in early adolescence that were, in, uh, that were associated with the development of clinically significant TMD pain. They found that female gender, somatization, the number of pain complaints, and life dissatisfaction was significant. Surprisingly, they, did find, they didn't find that depression was an independent vari variable in this study, although we know from some of the other studies that were cited earlier this evening that it, that it is in adults. This was a big study where they looked at the mothers of over 12,000 children and they followed them up for 31 years. And they found that parental depression during the offspring's childhood was significantly associated with facial pain and TMJ pain at rest. This was not found in the offspring of antenatally depressed mothers. And this study really highlighted the importance of effective treatment of parental depression. So in summary, looking at the studies, these are the childhood risk associations for temporomandibular disorders. Female gender, which Olga touched on, somatization, life dissatisfaction, history of physical abuse, possibly a history of sexual abuse, and parental depression during childhood. So hopefully the presentation today has underscored how important it is to be taking a good psychosocial history. Now, for someone who may not be routinely doing this or may be new to doing this, I can understand that it can be very confronting. So the photograph that you have that you see there on the top left is actually from a patient of mine. I think one of the things when taking a social history is to be aware of certain red flags that may clue you into the fact that you should be asking more questions or the patient may need a little bit more TLC. So this patient had brought in an entire box of splints that she had tried and none of them had provided her any relief. Now, if you are treating your patient and things are not going the way you expect, it's always a good idea to go back to baseline and reevaluate and see if you've missed anything. In the case of Debbie, which we discussed at the start of this presentation, um, we, I asked her father to wait in the waiting room so she would be more comfortable disclosing history to me. I'm not saying that that's the case for every patient, but sometimes you might find that it might be easier to talk to them alone. So if you don't have your assistant or other family members when the door is closed, then there are not too many people in the waiting room that can overhear. One of the components I think for taking a good psychosocial history is also following your gut and involving the team. So if you've got consent from the patient, involving their other health practitioners in their care may not be a bad idea because you may find out something that has not been disclosed and it might also clue you in to involve other team members for multidisciplinary treatment. I know this might sound a little bit trite, but I think there's not a lot in life that can't be accomplished with small little achievable steps. So if you're not asking the patient these questions for their psychosocial history, why not start tomorrow? So you can pick a patient, any patient, and just ask them how they are going, how their life is, if there is any reason that they can think of why they may not be getting better. So in the words of Nike, it's not my shoe there, but in the words of Nike, just do it. Now, the, one of the things, so if all else fails, it's, I, I think it's great to remember your prognosis, uh, why, why you are doing this, because finding out the patient's psychosocial history affects their prognosis. It helps your treatment planning. It can clue you in to involve other professionals or teams. And at the end, at the end of the day, it, we have to treat our patients holistically. Like the patient's pain is more than a joint pain or more than a headache. We, we care for our patients, so this should be something that's very relevant for us. And to, bring back, uh, to go back to the topic of today's webinar, which is can we prevent oral facial pain? Now, as I've underscored, the association between childhood adversity and oral facial pain is muddy at the moment. We know that this association, we don't know how it, we don't know how it happens and what the clear relationship really is. But if we can prevent childhood adversity in our pediatric patients, that can only be a good thing. 
So take home messages is awareness of chronic pain states and comorbid pain conditions, the importance of psychosocial factors, taking a pain history should include consideration of sociocultural features and practice makes perfect. This underscores the importance of the biopsychosocial model of management, which is often multidisciplinary. So you may have noticed as we were going through the presentation that I have a few children's drawings in there. Now this is actually from the special interest group uh, pain in childhood from the Portuguese Association for the Study of Pain from last year's global year, which was looking at vulnerable populations. And these drawings were um, from the exhibition called Drawings of My Pain and it had a very significant impact on me. So I hope you found them not inspiring, but I, I, I hope they impacted you too. So I would like to thank everyone for listening. Um, this is an area that I find very interesting and I'm hoping to conduct more research in the area. Thank you to Ramesh, who kindly accepted the invitation to moderate and also to the speakers, Tara and Olga, and most of all, to the listeners, ISP and Jeanette. If anybody has any questions, feel free to contact me. If we couldn't answer all of your questions, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for, for, for a wonderful presentation. Now, can I please get all the um, panelists to unmute um, so we can start um, taking some of these questions? Um, as I was saying before, uh, there, there, there are a fair few questions that have come in. So um, I'm going to, I guess, pick and choose and um, so that the um, attendees are aware we are over time, but we're going to go on for a bit longer. So if you're unable to hang around, you can perhaps watch it um, at a later time. So I'm going to, I'm going to get started with um, some of these questions. Um, I'm not going to um, identify the question that where the questions have come from rather than I'll, I'll pick the panelists that I believe um, would be most suited um, to answering this particular question. Um, Olga, would you like to take this question, please? Um, so this question, and I might paraphrase a little bit, when, when we try to make a pain model in animals, how much do we mimic, and, and it goes on to say, do you think it is representative, representative of an orofacial neuropathic pain in humans? So basically implying when you try and do a pain model in animals, whether um, this is any representation of um, the neuropathic pains that we see um, in humans. Are you happy to take that, Olga? Sure, sure. So uh, we have to keep in mind that animal models of nociception have two important components. Number one is the method of insult, and the second one is the subsequent end endpoint measurements. Right? So there are two elements, and the translation of animal models from the lab to the clinic has been limited with inflammatory pain models being more representative of the clinical representations of pain, but yet not perfect. And also, when we come to pain measurements, most of the pain measurements in rats are done on the um, evoked response to the stimulus. It's not necessarily reflective of spontaneous pain that we see in clinical setting. So it's, it's difficult to and efforts has been taken to develop methods that record the spontaneous pain in animals, but it's still hard to determine like what is really pain, right? So animals can't give us on a scale from zero to 10, show me how much pain you're in. It's more of the response to the evoked stimulus. Also the um, drug testing that was done in the animal models don't necessarily always translate to the clinic, but uh, again, these animal models are crucial in our understanding of um, mechanisms involved in different molecular pain, pain models. And ideally, if we could uh, use maybe other animals that are closer to us, like, you know, primates, which is most likely never happen, but they would give us a better understanding of, and probably we'll, we would mimic those animal models more closely to reflect the pain that we see in it. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Olga. Um, Tara, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, Tara, um, can you suggest an economical chair side test for neuropathic pain? 
uh, college forceps and uh, and history. So thank you. So so basically, <laughs> history. The history has to fit, as I've mentioned several times. Chronology. The onset of the event has to happen around. If we're talking specifically about post-traumatic neuropathic pain, then it's a surgical or some kind of intervention, injection, dermal ablation, lip fillers, whatever may, may have caused the tissue damage. And in most of the traumatic events, the neuropathic pain starts at that event. The only ones that have delay, and if you look to the, uh, you know, I've often questioned the uh, diagnostic criteria, we still have a three, six month window of onset um, but that's to include chemotherapy and radiotherapy and drug-induced uh, peripheral neuropathies. Uh, so, so traumatic neuropathy usually is of immediate onset, with the exception of endodontics, where you may have, a, may have a two to three delay, which I believe is due to the chemicals leaching out of the apex into the IDC, causing a delayed onset neuropathy. But otherwise, it's immediate onset. And then basically, you map out a neuropathic area. You can do it with a cocktail stick you don't even need dental instruments and a tissue so you just map out the area it has to be uh, obviously within the dermatome of the treatment so if you did an implant in the left mandible and the patient's complaining of numbness in their forehead you're off the hook and uh, so you map out the neuropathic area and then test that neuropathic area if they have pain to the um to touch or pain to cold or pain to hot that proves that they have allodynia if they have increased pain to sharp blunt then uh, you, your sharp stimulation or cold or hot uh, heat pain, then they're going to have hyperalgesia, thermal and mechanical hyperalgesia. And if they have a reduced response, then they've either got total anesthesia or they've more likely got hyposthesia. Thank you. Um, since you're on a roll, um, can I ask you, because there's a follow on from that, um, yeah. um, what's your opinion on pre surgical um, pharmacological treatments to prevent? Um, there's been, yeah, there's been it's a good question. There's been some work around looking at uh, tricyclic antidepressants, so amitriptyline, nortriptyline, and also the, gab, the gabanoids, so pregabalin, pre gabapentin, looking at preloading uh, the patients at high risk, particularly those patients talked about perhaps having uh, limb amputation pain, uh, so preventing limb amputation pain post breast surgery, post thoracotomy. Um, and the evidence is not great. Um, the, probably the best, the, be the strongest evidence is actually using local anesthetic where possible, even in an anesthetized patient, to maximize that afferent barrage intraoperatively. Thank you. Um, Amanda, question um, for you. Um, with regards to asking patients about um, childhood, um, um, the influence of childhood trauma and its effects, so are, are you just directly, are you suggesting a direct question? To, um, to an individual about childhood trauma, or is this a, do you um, recommend instituting the ACE questionnaire? You can. What I do for my patients is that I um, ask, so first when they present to the clinic, we ask them a, um, we get them to fill in a questionnaire and that has an amalgamation of, uh, for example, some of the questionnaires from the DCTMD, some of the things that we want to know. So we have some things that are written so that will cover some of the psychosocial history. As to whether I think everybody should be asking all of their patients whether they have ever had a history of abuse, I think that's a little bit of a dicey one. I think it would be good to use your clinical judgment to see if the patient will be receptive to that. I think as far as possible, finding out if any of these are playing a role in the patient's presentation would be ideal. But one of the comps, common comments that I get put to me from some of the people that I teach is that especially if it's a male clinician asking a female patient or even a younger female patient, they can feel very uncomfortable. I think my, my response to this is that if you are feeling very uncomfortable with it, then maybe practice it, take it in steps. Um, I think if you feel overly awkward, the patient will pick up on that too. But I'm actually very interested to find out, for example, what um, Tara does, because I know she's mentioned that she's put it into a questionnaire. So do you screen every patient for this, Yeah, Tara? we do. We do, Amanda. So I'm really lucky. We have this system called IMPARTS, which is set up by yes. the Institute yeah. of Psychiatry Psychology, which happens to be just opposite the hospital where I work. 
uh, set up by a senior um, psychiatrist, Matthew, Matthew Hoptoff. Um, and they started screening all patients in the whole of the, uh, attending all of the, the hospital, King's College Hospital. Um, patients and carers just looking at basic anxiety depression levels and then that led into a, 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 a evolving uh, specific clinicians who wanted to screen their patients um, mm. and so my patients are we follow like you the DCTMD but we don't have the jaw function we've left out a few bits but we have the PHQ4, PHQ9, PHQ15, we have the global uh, chronic pain scale, we have the BPI facial pain, we have a um, catastrophizing score, PCS. We also look at, um, what else we look at? We look at post P PTSD and we look at pain detectors, a neuropathic uh, modified one for oral facial pain, neuropathic pain. But actually on top of that, we do a very basic five question sleep questionnaire. And we also use the SPAC, so the sexual and physical abuse questionnaire. But the, the important thing about these, these questionnaires is they're all done on a tablet form uh, by the mm. patient when they arrive uh, in, the, in the waiting room. So it's done very independently in their own time. Um, and then that's automatically uploaded onto my electronic patient record. I am so lucky. So we actually have that with all the red flags screened up if they have high anxiety, high depression, somatic, uh, somatic disorder, whatever the problem is, with recommended treatments. So we've actually scripted in, you know, urgent referral to psychiatrist, urgent, urgent referral to IAP services, which is our local or G GP, general medical practitioner. So we have all that inbuilt in the system. And I cannot tell you, it's been incredibly well received mm. by patients because it gives them an opportunity for the first time sometimes to actually talk about stuff. Um, yeah. we also, I also routinely ask about significant life events that happened around the onset of the facial pain, but yeah. also I ask about yeah. previous significant life events, particularly if they have a profile that's worrying or based on that screening. So, so I have, it's revolutionized my patient care. We are in the process of actually uh, enabling that system. So I, my patients can now do that. I haven't done it yet because obviously I haven't seen my pain patients for a while, but we are now in a position where we can actually get those patients screened before they even come into hospital. And on the basis of that, I'm hoping that we may be able to build an app that will be available for chronic or facial pain clinicians or dentists or whoever, uh, varying scales from very simple few uh, anxiety depression screening through to more complex or facial pain patients. Um, at, how we grasp the results, uh, harness the results of that, I'm not quite sure. But the app is actually about halfway through development at the moment. So I, I think it's absolutely, I don't think, I feel for the first time in my life, and Ramesh has heard me say this just recently in March in Sydney, I feel like I'm actually treating the whole patient for the first time in my life. I'm not just treating their face. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes, it does actually. Yes. Yeah, thank you for that. Oh, well, um, someone's commented that they can't wait for the app. I can't wait either. That'd be great. Well, it'll be simple to begin with, but we'll build on it. We're trialing it in the, we've got an orofacial pain alliance nationally. So we're just about to trial it with the group nationally. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, Olga, um, one, a question for you, if that's okay? Sure, sure. Um, so um, it, it started with a compliment, Ex excellent presentation. Thanks. Um, just wanted to know if there are any diagnostic procedures being used in the diagnosis of orofacial pain other than imaging and nerve blocks. So any other diagnostic procedures that you feel may be useful apart from imaging and nerve blocks? So I think mainly history and symptom based. So in certain cases, imaging uh, blocks, neurological exam, including QSTs. Uh, certain orofacial pains and other pains have specific uh, blood tests, for example, temporal uh, arthritis, and um, this, this is the aim for the future for diagnostic biological mar marker axes that if we could develop something that I came across an article that um, said that they had a panel of 72 um, polymorphisms that they could map people at the risk of pain. But I don't think we are there yet, but it's definitely for the future. Right, thank you. And just to follow up on that, um, do you find the, um, carrying out a QST um, as part of the um, history and examination process, um, well, in this case, the examination process changes your treatment plan in any way? Mm, does QST change the treatment plan? For neuropathic pain. For neuropathic pain. Can I interject there? Sure, sure. Please. Yeah, I don't want to, uh, Olga, are you happy? 
I can I feel I can sort of address this because essentially it's really interesting. Obviously, the QST for neuropathic pain was de again derived by Ralph Barron's German Net Neuropathic Network team. Uh, and it involves, I think, a minimum of 11 um, criteria. And when Peter Svensson and Mark Drangschultz and others try to apply this to their oral facial pain patients, it was taking like three hours per patient. So, there's, so, there's, so the full QST protocol is not appropriate for even research patients. Now, uh, just Garland has, has talked about where QST may be indicated. So if you look at the uh, diagnostic criteria and the um, nanofinarap I mentioned about grading neuropathic pain, then um, technically in the limbs, um, they will um, go as far as doing not just qualitative sensory testing, but they will go as far as doing QST to have a definite diagnosis of um, neuropathic pain, along with many neurologists do a, a, do a biopsy, a skin biopsy as well. But uh, I wrote a paper, a, a review with uh, Maria Devine, Justin Durham, and Don Nixdorf, which I think was published uh, a few years ago. And we looked at the diagnostic criteria for aura, orofacial neuropathic pain. And we felt actually just a QST, just confirming that you have the, um, the chronology of the traumatic event and the qualitative test sensory testing with a neuropathic area that may be the hyperesthetic or hyperesthetic with positive or negative signs. That was probably sufficient to qualify that it was a definite neuropathic pain in that patient. But the other question is, uh, just Carlin, and obviously with a new diagnostic criteria, I call the burning mouth syndrome, which some people would say, is it neuropathic pain or is it nosoplastic pain or is it both? Just Carlin, then based on her recommendations, we now have to do a qualitative sensory testing minimum or probably QST in burning mouth patients to decide those that don't and do, do and don't have somatosensory changes. So th that's where the QST definitely has a role in diagnosis of patients. Thank you, Tara, that was interesting. Um, Amanda, can I get you to take this question, please? Um, uh, what, what sort of um, areas do you typically cover when asking um, a psychosocial background in a new patient? Um, you cover things like job, stress, family. Could you please um, let us know? I guess this is in the in this in in I guess in an in informal um, history type um, approach rather than in a question questionnaire. Yeah, so it is fairly. Um, oops, sorry. Can you hear me? I put my mic up. Yeah. yeah so it is fairly. Up. Thank you. So it is fairly extensive. Um, what I like to ask is sleep. How many hours you sleep at night? Are they sleepy during the day? Do they have any trouble falling or staying asleep? I'd like to know about their diet, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, caffeine. Um, when it comes to their pain, the effect of pain on their daily life, does their pain prevent them from working? If there's any sort of insurance claim, financial stress, uh, any, uh, as Tara said, any sort of issue happening around the onset of the pain, you'd be surprised. I had so many um, people undergoing legal troubles being sued at the time mm. when the pain began deaths in the family, who they live with at home, their support system, who they're with. It's, it's fairly extensive. I mean, what might actually be better um, in the interest of time is maybe, Jeanette, I don't know if we can do this, but I'm actually happy to send out some resources to people that are interested about the type of things that, that we ask. Um, the other alternative is to look at the DC TMD because a lot of the questions are on there as well. And yeah, I, I think that might probably be easier than me going through everything. Yeah, so I'll just, about. yeah, I'll just interject here. So we'll send a follow-up email to everybody um, that's either attended or signed up um, with a bunch of resources and all um, the slides and or the recording and a whole bunch of different things um, through IASP or through any of the resources our panelists have mentioned. Um, and then if our panelists are interested, I can also just send all of the questions um, and then we can, you can write the answers and we can also post that on our website since I know now it's about a half hour over our time, <laughs> um, which is wonderful. Um, but I know a lot of people have had to leave in that time frame. Um, so I think that that would probably be be our best bet going forward. That way everybody can get all the information and you all can have a little more time to answer the questions or provide other resources as well. Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, sh can, I, can I finish off with a question that, um, Tara, if you don't mind answering this question because I've had multiple questions on this one theme. Um, 
I guess I'm going to try and tie two or three questions into one. In, in the case of um, PTTN, so a caused by an implant, how and when do you decide whether to remove it? Could the removal cause further damage? And then there's also questions about you remove the implant at 24 hours post-op if neuropathic signs and symptoms are apparent. I think um, this is something that even I, um, um, even this week faced, um, you know, the implants right over the canal. Um, clearly, patient has neuropathic pain and associate um, signs and symptoms. Um, would, would removing it cause more damage? Should have this should this have been removed at you know to the twenty four hour mark? Do you mind um, commenting on that, please? Thank you, Ramesh. So essentially, you have probably 24, 30, 30 hours to get it out. After that, there's no point doing it. Um, and uh, I keep trying to remind clinicians that actually the patient's more important than the implant, which I think a lot of implantologists struggle with. They're very precious about their implants, so the patient's more important than the implant. If a patient reports, or you phone them up, hopefully, proactively, uh, the following day after surgery, and after local anaesthetic, they have persistent pain, you get them back, you check that they probably had, they have a neuropathic area in the lip and the gingival region, either with uh, positive signs. If they're, if they're hypoesthetic or numb, you can discuss with the patient whether they want to leave it like that. It's very likely that they're going to get worse based on um, the 1,331 patients we've analysed. Uh, they're more likely going to stay the same, but if they have pain, they're probably want to not want to. Get, it's not going to go away. It's going to be permanent. So you need to get the implant out. Does the removal of the implant cause more damage to the nerve? No, I think the maximum damage has been done to the nerve already by the implant prep drill. But by removing the implant, hopefully you're actually minimising the continued inflammation and possible a bleeding in the area and primary secondary ischemia, which is probably causing um, ongoing nerve injury. It just takes six hours causing um, primary or secondary ischemia around a rat, a rat inferior alveolar nerve. Six hours, you get a permanent degree of da damage in that nerve. So it doesn't take long for the permanent ischemia, the ischemia to cause permanent um, uh, uh, neuropathic damage in the nerve. So, so if the patient has a very small neuropathic area with hyposthesia, you would discuss with the patient whether they want to leave it in. But if they have a large neuropathic area and they have pain or a moderate to large neuropathic area with, with pain, or even a small neuropathic area with pain, I suspect the patient will want you to get it out. So get it out and review the patient. And what if, um, what if it's been a few weeks or a couple of months? Treat them as a chronic or a facial pain patient. They won't be and happy. And leave the that. implant. Yeah. And you no leave point. the implant as is. Yeah, there's no point doing anything. All right. Thank you, Tara. Unfortunately, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all three um, speakers. Um, thank you, Tara. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, Amanda. Um, apologies to the dozens of questions that keep coming in. Um, um, we can only get through so much, but um, hopefully um, the AS, uh, ASP can facilitate on getting some of this information out to you promptly. So over to you um, now, Jeanette. You there? Sure, yes. I'd just like to thank everyone for attending. Um, and I will say that we will um, uh, hopefully be able to answer all these questions and post them online. Um, uh, we have our whole Global Year webpage, so I hope that people will also visit that. And if you are not members, I hope you will also become members. Um, we have a special interest group related to oral facial pain, so I think um, that might be of interest to a lot of people on this webinar. Um, and all of that information will be in our follow-up email. Um, if anybody does have any questions, we're all available, um, and you can find all of our contact information on the IASP website for. IASP staff. Um, and I really just appreciate everyone coming and sticking with us for the extra time and all of your questions and just all of your engagement.